I'm really uh, appreciative of being here and of having the opportunity to share some of my work today and uh, have thoroughly enjoyed the interactions with the postdocs so far at the Immersion Workshops. I think that's a tremendous thing to do um, and uh, really an incredible group um, that you've assembled. So really exciting to see uh, what the, the, the seeds of that, uh, uh, how they grow and, and and all the ways in which uh, you guys are going to branch out and become that next generation of people who are doing it way better than what we're doing it now. Um, um, also, I, I need to talk to John Kramer because I need to understand team science more. <laughs> um, so today I wanted to um, share so, uh, uh, some work in progress. This is very much still work in progress, even though the NSF funding for it has come to a close, <laughs> um, which is often the case. Um, uh, but before I do that, uh, and before I jump into that, um, I thought it would be maybe of interest to this group, particularly to know a little bit about me and my background. As Morgan said, I, I, I double majored in German and history at Washington University. I even was bold enough to put the dates on here, which really makes me feel old, but <laughs> I thought, you know, as long as we're burying our souls, <laughs> you, you, should, you should see these dates. Um, the, and, and one of the reasons I wanted to also kind of narrate my history a little bit is because I have had a bit of a nonlinear path, and I think that might be the case for a lot of people here. And so I thought that might be interesting. Um, after I, I got a double major in German and history, I, you know, I knew I didn't really want to uh, be a German history professor or a history or a German professor or a teacher. Uh, I did it because I was interested in those subjects. I wasn't particularly practically minded. Um, but I, I was always interested in the environment. I ended up working for five years in nonprofits in St. Louis and stumbled across the work of Herman Daly, uh, who really is the father of ecological economics, became very intrigued by that and, um, and did a bunch of reading um, and wanted to go back to school in ecological economics, um, which wasn't a thing, um, really, in terms, of a, in terms of a degree program. The closest I could come was to go to University of Maryland, where Herman Daly uh, was teaching in the public policy department. Um, and uh, I ended up then uh, get, getting my degree from uh, the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. And so in the immersion workshop, we've kind of been having this on ongoing dialogue about the distinctions between environmental and resource economics and ecological economics. Um, and so that is absolutely a thing. Um, and and I, I think that, you know, part of what I hope you get out of this talk is to realize that that we really are coming much closer together in terms of these distinctions that once I think were really much more definitive and uh, and big than 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 what they are now, um, but it is still definitely a continuum. So um, I've been at uh, Ohio State as assistant professor through professor. Um, I think I'm almost I've been there for almost 20 years, which is um, shocking. Um, and you know, I've done a lot of interdisciplinary work uh, that's been funded through NSF, uh, USDA, NOAA, others. Um, as Morgan mentioned, we work together on the BES, the Baltimore Ecosystem Study LTR um, project, and uh, and I've had involvement in in other ways as well. But you know, I have uh, collaborated with a lot of different um, people from a lot of different areas. Um, and, uh, and had a lot of uh, experience in trying to develop more interdisciplinary programs. The most recent one of this is the Sustainable and Resilient Economy Program at Ohio State, uh, in which we are really trying to invest, seriously invest, in bringing new faculty to OSU who are interdisciplinary in nature and in orientation and in what they want to do. Um, our program partners with departments at OSU to make these faculty hires. Um, and so the tenure resides with the department, but the appointment is a joint appointment between the department and our program. And so in, because it's a joint appointment, um, these new faculty hires are, are expected and rewarded for doing interdisciplinary work. And so we've hired uh, 21 new faculty so far in this capacity. We've got eight open searches right now, um, and with a few more to come. Uh, so we'll probably, you know, have hired about 30 new faculty in sustainability science at OSU um, by the time another year or two passes. Um, and this is really broad. I mean, we're hiring across, um, you know, engineering and environmental science, agricultural science, social sciences, uh, and, and the humanities. So um, we've, we've done um, quite a lot in terms of trying to build this up. 
Um, and of course, the goal then is to build up the, the uh, sustainability science research, teaching, community engagement, and, and partnerships. And so our program is also oriented towards helping to do all those things as well. Um, because, uh, I, and so this is a little bit of inside baseball. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this before I get to my main talk. Inside baseball in the sense that I wanted to just try to put into context some of the things that Josh was just saying in, in his talk in our seminar. Um, so for those of you who weren't part of the seminar, my apologies. Um, but I, I, I think it's general enough that you'll still get something out of it. Um, it also relates to the, the work I want to share with you because really the ultimate goal of all of this work is to try to say something about are we sustainable or not and how are we using our resources in ways that are more or less sustainable and there are ways that we can reallocate resources and activities in ways that will make us more sustainable over the long run. So to understand what we mean by that, uh, we have to ask what does it mean to be sustainable and how are we defining those concepts. And in economics, you know, there's this tradition of sustainability um, that's been defined uh, in, in various ways. And so the two ends of that spectrum are so-called weak sustainability versus strong sustainability. Um, weak sustainability is uh, the approach that traditional economists have taken to thinking about this. Um, and as we've been talking about in our immersion workshop, um, it has to do with questions of how substitutable are, you know, as we're, as we're you know, uh, harvesting um, forests, for example, and converting uh, trees into lumber and into manufactured capital, um, there's a substitution there between natural capital, which are the forests, and the manufactured capital, which are the things that we're making with the wood. Um, and the question is, how substitutable are these things? And that's one specific example, but you can think of many other examples. As we extract oil and coal from the, from the uh, subsurface uh, to produce energy, um, we're clearly degrading and using up that non-renewable resource, um, but we're also gaining um, uh, in terms of the things that are being used to, to produce, the things we're producing with those resources. So this kind of trade-off, all these different kinds of trade-offs, uh, raise this question about how, how substitutable, uh, how much can we afford to continue to extract these non-renewable resources or convert these renewable resources uh, in terms of what are the benefits we're getting from those and what are the costs um, that we're absorbing in terms of the degradation of the ecosystem. And so weak sustainability um, is of the mindset that we can do this in a substitutable kind of way, um, that we always will be able to extract another unit of the natural capital uh, and substitute the uh, uh, manufactured capital for that. Um, although we may not always be able to do that at the same rate. So as we're drawing down our natural capital, it's going to become more and more expensive for us in terms of the costs. And so understanding those trade-offs is really what is at the heart of weak sustainability. An example of this would be the Conference of Wealth Index that the World Bank has put together. Strong sustainability really focuses more on physical limits. So whereas weak sustainability is in terms of value, strong sustainability is really in terms of physical limits. Josh used the example of planetary boundaries as an example of this. And the assumption here is that there's much less limited, much more limited, if not no substitution that we really can make between our, uh, in, in terms of drawing down and ecosystem, natural resources, and, and, and uh, having environmental impacts, um, and the manufactured capital or the man-made capital that we're making as a result of that. Um, and the reality is that these are really two ends of a continuum. Uh, and, and the answer lies somewhere in between. And so, you know, as we think about this, we really need, um, as, as we're thinking about policies to guide this question of what makes us more or less sustainable, we need a combination of economic and physical measures to guide policy decision making. Um, the reality is, is that there are physical limits and surpassing those ecological thresholds are hugely costly for us. Um, and, and we don't always know where those ecological thresholds are. Um, and so we want to most likely try to respect those ecological thresholds and design our policies in ways that are going to prevent us from exceeding those thresholds. On the other, and, and, and on the other hand, uh, there's, you know, in some cases there may be quite a lot of wiggle room to trade things off, um, in which case then, you know, having this more weak sustainability perspective is, is a useful approach. And so we need some combination of physical, uh, physical uh, limitations on one hand and um, and trade-offs and weak sustainability on the other. Um, 
the example I wanted to share is just some, uh, uh, some work from one of our new hires, actually, through this program that I'm directing at Ohio State. Young Yang Kai came from Stanford. Um, he's, an he's an associate professor in the Department of Agriculture and Resource uh, and Development Economics at Ohio State. Um, and he's done some really interesting work looking at global climate change and global economic models in which he has accounted for, uh, as you can see here, five different tipping points in the climate, uh, in, in the, uh, climate system. So for example, uh, the melt of the Greenland ice sheet, collapse of the Atlantic thermocline circulation, dieback of Amazon rainforest. He's got five of them art articulated here and he's incorporated this into a dynamic global economic climate change model uh, to better understand what is the role of thresholds and uncertainty in de determining our policy. And what he shows is that, uh, you know, once we incorporate this, these threshold effects, which are uncertain, that we have a much more uh, aggressive policy towards uh, dampening down uh, carbon emissions. And in fact, the optimal result is a complete stop of carbon emissions by the middle of this century. Um, if the goal is to maintain surface temperature increase below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's what he finds from this model being optimal. This is really radically different than a model in which you would not incorporate the uncertainty, you would not incorporate the threshold effects. Um, you know, and the, the so-called DICE, and this is the so-called DICE model, if that means anything to anybody, um, that Nordhaus developed, um, that your, Nordhaus is at Yale, <laughs> developed. Um, and you know, when you run this DICE model in kind of a more naive way, uh, deterministic, no threshold effects, you actually get that the optimal surface temper in temperature increase is somewhere in the, in the range of four degrees Celsius. So it's radically different. Um, and so I just wanted to share that as an example of the kind of thing that, you know, that economists uh, working in collaboration with climate change scientists are starting to do. And it's, a, it's, it's you know, this, this much more realistic approach in terms of representing the ecological dynamics is because we now understand it and because we're now collaborating more closely with the climate change scientists. And we can start to incorporate those things into our economic models. Okay, that was my aside. <laughs> now I'm coming back to the main top for, talk for today. Um, what I'd like to do is share some work f uh, with you, and as I said, the, much of this is still ongoing work, um, in which we are looking at this question of, uh, of an integrated system of land and water dynamics. Um, and if you don't get anything else from my talk, I, w what I'd love for you to recognize is that this kind of work is always, because there are so many moving parts to doing this kind of thing, it's team science. And so here's the team, um, and it is uh, people who span the disciplinary boundaries from, uh, you know, hydrologists and ecologists, uh, geographers and economists, um, social uh, uh, psychologists, behavioral scientists, um, and uh, and policy people. So all of those disciplines are represented here by this team. The work that I'm going to present today is is is. Uh, focused on the, the, this sub-team here and, and the kind of thing that mostly that we've been doing, but there's other work uh, that I won't focus on that has um, been, uh, that other, others have been leading. This is funding from the NSF Coupled Human Natural Systems Program, for those of you who know that um, program, which has been really instrumental in incentivizing and supporting a lot of this interdisciplinary work. It's been going on since late. 98. 98, yeah, late 90s, that's what he's going to say. It's, it's, I, I think We're it's probably. <laughs> I think it is this, along with the LTRs, um, you know, have been some of the most fundamentally important uh, funding for, for supporting this kind of interdisciplinary work. So the starting point for this is this notion of uh, ecosystem services that are generated. We're interested in Lake Erie. Um, Lake Erie is, um, as you know, one of the, uh, Great Lakes, um, it, uh, one of the handful of the Great Lakes, and it's, uh, it produces tremendous ecosystem services, drinking water for 11 million people, um, and uh, uh, one of the largest recreational sport fisheries in the world. Uh, it's the so-called walleye capital of the world. Um, and as a result of that, there are this tremendous uh, economic activity that's generated because of the presence of this amazing resource. 
Uh, Forty percent of all Great Lakes charter boats are located in Lake Erie, for example. It's a $1.5 billion sports fishery. Um, and uh, it generates a lot of economic value in terms of tourism. Um, you know, people come to Lake Erie as a result of uh, having all of these recreational benefits. The other part of this story is what's going on in the land around the lake. Um, and this watershed uh, that feeds into the lake happens to be um, very agriculturally dominated. Um, and the, in fact, the watershed that we're going to particularly focus on here is called the Mami watershed. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. Um, but it is over 85% in agricultural land cover, which is quite high. Um, and it is one of the most productive um, agricultural regions uh, in, uh, certainly in Ohio, and even in the, and in, in it's also as productive as some of the other areas in the, in the Corn Belt in the Midwest. Um, you can see some of the numbers here in terms of the value of commodity crops that are being produced in this area. Um, the intersection of this, these two facts uh, is a degradation of water quality and an increasing problem with harmful algal blooms that have been increasing in severity since about 1995. Um, the, uh, and if you know the history of Lake Erie at all, we can go back even to the 1970s when Johnny Carson uh, declared the Lake, Lake Erie is dead. Um, and uh, that was due to a different problem. That was due to uh, a lot of the, whoops, a lot of the um, chemicals um, from uh, heavy industry around the lake. Here's Cleveland here. Um, um, and, uh, and from the water, the rivers that were feeding into the lake here, uh, causing the water to literally catch on fire. Um, and so there was all kinds of burning, uh, literally burning of the river um, and, uh, and, and heavy toxins and, uh, that, were, that were leading to that. And it was uh, very much uh, an issue for, uh, for the lake. But you know, those point sources got cleaned up and lake water quality was increasingly becoming better through about the mid-90s. Um, and then that's when the point sources, the non-point sources, um, largely due to agriculture, uh, started becoming more and more of a problem. And of course today, with increasing um, precipitation events, particularly in increasing in severity of those events due to climate change, this is becoming an even uh, greater problem. Because as you have more and more rainfall, it's just washing all the uh, fertilizer uh, from the farm fields into the lake. And so the harmful algal blooms is a problem that has been increasing in uh, intensity, severity, um, also duration of these harmful algal blooms um, since about the 1990s. D does anyone, had, has anyone heard of the Toledo uh, water, drinking water crisis that occurred a few years ago? They like literally, yet yeah, were you there? Uh, no, but <laughs> people from Toledo were coming, going down to my hometown to get yeah. water. <laughs> it shut down, uh, so ha they happened to have a, one of these outbreaks right around the single intake for the public drinking water for the city of Toledo shut down uh, public drinking water supply for over two days. It was a huge crisis. And so that was also, that was in 2014, I think, but it was also a, a, a big uh, rallying cry for, you know, doing something about the lake. And so there's been, since then and even before that, a lot of policy effort focused on how do we, how do we, uh, what, what do we need to do um, to improve this water quality and to address the harmful algal bloom problem. Um, there is a Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, the GLWQA, um, that has identified a set of policy targets. And so one of the big ones is uh, recognizing that uh, the largest contributor uh, to, the, to the harmful algal bloom problem really is coming from agricultural land use. And so uh, this, uh, this uh, agreement protocol has set a, 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 a target of a 40% reduction goal in both the total phosphorus as well as the dissolved reactive phosphorus that's running off of the land uh, through the waterways and into Lake Erie, um, a 40% reduction goal uh, relative to the baseline in 2008. Here you see a picture of the Maumee watershed, uh, river watershed. This is the, the, the area that we're gonna be focusing on in our work. Um, this is the Maumee Bay here and then the watershed is essentially this area here. You don't, I, we don't, I don't have it 
fully captured in this photo, but it's this area here. It's primarily in um, Ohio and it spills over a little bit into Indiana, a little bit into Michigan. So the real big question here is, can we achieve this, this target? Um, you know, I mean, we could ask another question, which is, is this a reasonable target? And we could look at what the trade-offs are in terms of benefits and costs of achieving a 40% reduction goal. Um, and that is a bigger question. Um, but even, let's, you know, even just accepting that this is a, a reasonable target in terms of 40% reduction, how do we do this? How do we get to this 40% uh, reduction goal? And what are the sorts of policies and incentives um, that are going to be most effective uh, and efficient in terms of allowing us to do this? So um, one of in very interesting starting point for this work is a recent article that Don Scavia, who's from University of Michigan, and others, Jay Martin, who's at Ohio State, have done, um, uh, in which uh, about four or five different research groups uh, developed SWAT models of the Maumee watershed. SWAT being a, a physical hydrological model of the watershed um, that describes the fluxes of nutrients through the watershed um, and, uh, and and uh, with inputs of temperature and land use and uh, uh, soil characteristics, et cetera. I could ask you to explain it better than I can. <laughs> um, but the, the, what, what they did is they, they took uh, their various uh, specifications of the SWAT model and they asked, um, you know, what, it, what if we engaged in all kinds of different changes in terms of the land management activity. So the SWAT model incorporates not only the physical characteristics, but it also incorporates the way in which the land is being managed. So for example, um, uh, do we have, um, what, what is the, uh, the uh, pattern of crops that have been planted on the land? Uh, and then what, how, what kind of nutrient management do we have on that land? Um, for example, are we, um, are we injecting fertilizer into the soil? Um, which is one way to do it, or are we simply broadcasting the fertilizer um, so that it then sits on top of the soil and eventually it, it gets absorbed by the soil. So these kinds of, um, and, and you know, in terms of best management practices, injecting the fertilizer into the soil is a better practice because you reduce the amount of runoff. And so again, thinking about, you know, rain events um, uh, that, that are going to come and cause fertilizer to run off, the big problem is uh, not in terms of the sedimentation, so not in terms of the sedimentation of the soil into the water, as much as it is just the runoff of the fertilizer itself from the surface of that land into directly into the waterways. And so something like subsurface placement, where you're injecting the fertilizer into the soil, is considered a best management practice. Another example of a best management practice would be cover crops, so that um, rather than allowing the, the cr uh, crops once they're harvested, rather than allowing that land to lie essentially barren, um, you're, you're actually planting with additional plants that are absorbing some of those nutrients. So rather than the nutrients running off, they're being absorbed by the plant growth. And, uh, and so there's a handful of these best management practices that have been recommended. And so what Scavia et al. did is they looked at these different variety of different practices uh, to see what the impact of these changes in land use and changes in land management would be on the, uh, uh, on the nutrient loadings of phosphorus into Lake Erie. And so here what you see is, here's the targeted uh, reduction in the total phosphorus loading. Here's the targeted uh, reduction in the dissolved reactive ph phosphorus loading. Um, and then based on these predictions from these multiple different uh, hydrological models, they were able to uh, generate uh, you know, error bars here in terms of the likelihood of these different uh, management practices leading to reductions in this nutrient runoff. And so on this basis, um, they found that you know, some of the most successful ag management scenarios would be things like, for example, a 50% reduction in phosphorus application uh, combined with a, uh, with a subsurface application injecting the fertilizer into the soil in fall. For example, that's, that's one management scenario that, that, uh, that uh, emerged as being quite uh, successful in terms of reducing overall loadings. Um, and then they looked at other ones as well in terms of various uh, combinations of different types of best management practices. 
So this is incredibly useful. It's incredibly useful to know what kinds of changes are we targeting. If we're trying to get to this 40% reduction level, what kind of changes on the land do we need to try to implement so that we get to that reduction level? But this is not the only thing that we need to know, right? We need to know how do we make this happen? I mean, we're talking about individuals who privately own and operate and manage their land. We're thinking about farmers who are operating the land, farmers who uh, are either owning the land themselves and operating it, or oftentimes also renting the land uh, from someone else who owns it. But in either case, these are individual private decisions that these operators are making, that farm, farm operators are making. And so immediately we're faced with this question of what kinds of policies uh, can we put in place that are going to incentivize the individual farmers to quote unquote do the right thing, to, to reduce their phosphorus fertilizer applications, to increase their best management practices in terms of cover crops, in terms of subsurface fertilizer uh, placement, et cetera. Um, how, you know, how do we know how farmers are going to respond? Uh, and there's going to be heterogeneity among these farmers. Not all farmers are the same. Right? They have different beliefs, they have different experiences, they have different education levels. Uh, so there's going to be heterogeneity there. It's also true that not any, every land parcel is the same. Right? Some land parcels are going to be more susceptible to phosphorus fertilizer runoff problems than other land parcels. So there's heterogeneity in the physical characteristics of the land that also matter. So how do we figure this out given that we're really talking about uh, a much more complicated system. It's not as easy as to say, uh, you know, telling farmers to go out and reduce phosphorus applications by 50% and engaging in these best management practices um, because it, they're making their own private decisions. Um, and, and so this is really what we call a complex coupled human natural system in the sense that we have farmers making land use and management decisions on these individual land parcels um, that's leading to fertilizer runoff from the fields and into the waterways. Um, this is creating landscape uh, change, scale changes at the watershed level. Um, that is the cumulative effect of these land use and land management decisions that are generating the runoff um, that all run into Lake Erie uh, and that are leading to uh, concentrations of, uh, of, uh, of harmful al algae and harmful algal blooms that are impacting then um, ecosystem services such as uh, sport fishing, beach going, um, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, habitat uh, quality, which is then leading to land and lake management policies which feed back into farmer decision making. And so this, if we really want to understand this question and be able to answer this question, this is the coupled human natural system that we need to be able to understand through uh, data analysis and through modeling. And so that's what we've set out to do. Um, and so let me walk you through kind of the full version of the in integrated set of models that we're pursuing. And then I'm going to focus on just a subset of those. All right, so if we really wanted to model this entire uh, system, or at least the, the most important pieces of this system, what are we trying to do? Well, the first thing we're trying to do is understand so if we go back to this question of how are man land and lake management policies impacting farmer decision, right? So that's going to be our first question is how do policies Im influence these farmer land use and land management decisions? That's really a, a behavioral question, right? And so we need, so this is, this is going to be informed by our models of economic uh, and behavioral analysis and modeling. And so that's one piece of it. The next piece of it is, how do we then go from this individual level decision, right? So we've got heterogeneous farmers operating heterogeneous parcels of land, making decisions about how they're, the kinds of crops they're producing, how they're managing this land, the types of best management practices they're either pursuing or not pursuing. Um, how do we go from that individual level then up to this spatial landscape level, which is really what we need to be able to do in order to understand the cumulative effect of all of these actions on phosphorus loadings into Lake Erie. And so here, we need to go from this individual level to a spatial landscape level um, that is also then accounting for 
changes in land use, changes in land management due to policy changes um, that then feed into the runoff from the edge of field uh, that then, uh, and then somehow understand how that aggregates across the watershed um, through the physical hydrological model to uh, generating then phosphorus loadings into Lake Erie. Um, we then could go further, right, because it doesn't just stop with that. We then want to really understand what are the impacts of that on uh, the ch those changes in ecosystem services that we talked about in terms of the sport fishing, in terms of the, uh, the uh, habitat uh, quality and all the other stuff that um, is happening when harmful algal blooms are negatively impacting these ecosystem services. Um, if we do then, and, and then what are the, if we have policies that are seeking to reduce these loadings, how much are, is that really able to improve the, the services that we care about? Um, and what's the value of that? And so that's where economic data and models come in again. So that ultimately we are doing a cost benefit analysis of the system, but it's a much more complicated cost benefit analysis than what you might typically think of. Right, because what we're trying to do here is account for all the, the dynamics that are going to occur in this lake in terms of the, 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 the way in which these nutrient loadings are, uh, are, are impacting the lake dynamics and the production of these ecosystem services. We're trying to account for in a very highly spatially articulated way uh, the way in which the phosphorus runoff is accumulating over space, over time, um, and, and leading to loadings into, the lake, into Lake Erie. And here, you know, at the top, we're accounting for all the heterogeneity of the farmer decision making um, and the, the kinds of policies that are going to impact uh, these land management decisions. And so it's a cost benefit analysis, but it's a very complicated one. Do you propagate air through? So we, yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> we, we, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, I'm going to focus on these two pieces. And I'll talk about how we deal with um, the fact that this is really a probabilistic model, right? So, and do we propagate air? I mean, the way we would do that is run a bunch of different scenarios for a range of uh, draws from, you know, um, uh, uh, random events, whether that w would enter, and that could enter in several ways. That could enter through the, the SWAP model in terms of weather conditions, for example. Um, and it also enters here in terms of the the probabilistic way in which we're representing the human behavior. Um, all right, so uh, here you see some of the uh, models and uh, data um, that we've collected to do this. Um, the things that I won't talk about today, so let me just highlight those so you have a sense of this. We've done some work on uh, willingness to pay for various policies. Um, uh, so for example, looking at uh, whether Ohio residents would be more likely to support a tax on fertilizer which would be one way of, of trying to account for um, the, the costs, the, the externality costs of these land management decisions that are creating an excessive amount of phosphorus that's running off. Um, versus, so a tax versus, for example, uh, uh, you can do the carrot or the stick, right? So a tax would be the stick. Carrots would be uh, payments, subsidies essentially, payments for doing the right thing, uh, what economists like to call payment for ecosystem services. Um, and so. Uh, and, and then there might be other, other things that we could do here too. There might be, uh, instead of taxes, maybe you would have fines. You know, so if someone's not engaging in the proper set of best management practices, we'd have inspectors that go out there and actually look and to see and, and see what's going on on the land and find farmers that aren't doing that. So you can envision all kinds of different ways in which we might uh, create policies that are gonna incentivize farmers one way or the other to quote unquote do the right thing. So in terms of policy support, what we found is um, that Ohio residents really don't want to, they, they favor the carrot versus the stick. Um, and uh, they'd rather be able to pay farmers to do the right thing uh, rather than uh, fighting them or penalizing them or, or taxing them. Uh, of course, um, the unanswered question there is where does that money come from <laughs> in terms of that payment? Um, and so uh, yeah, ideally you need really some combination of a tax to generate the revenue um, and then uh, the payments to incentivize the right thing. Um, some of the other things I won't talk about are the, the uh, mechanistic and statistical models that have been developed for the lake as well as some of the non-market valuation that has been done for looking at the value of these ecosystem services. Uh, for example, um, you know, we've done work looking at the 
impacts of harmful algal blooms on um, sports recreation and uh, trips that, uh, that anglers um, will take and, uh, and looking at the extent to which they might alter their decision making if there's a harmful algal bloom that occurs in an area where they normally would fish and what the costs are that they incur uh, because of that. Um, and we've looked at other things like, for example, the capitalization of the harmful algal blooms into housing values, the value of the homes that are around the lake. So I, I'm actually not gonna talk about those things. I want, what I wanna focus on today is just this piece here looking at going from policies to farmer decision making to then aggregating up to this uh, spatial um, level of a watershed to understand uh, then what the loadings into Lake Erie are uh, from, the, from the phosphorus that's running off. All right, so how do we do this? Well, one of the starting points, very importantly, um, you know, not surprisingly, is to understand farmer decision making. And so we need to get data on that. And so one of the first things that we started off doing um, very early on, it was a uh, survey of farmers. And we focused here on farmers that are operating larger operations uh, of corn and, and the traditional commodities, since that's really the vast uh, majority of the phosphorus fertilizer use is coming from, in this area, is coming from corn, traditional uh, crops of corn and beans, soybeans. And so we focused on those um, farmers that were over a certain size, uh, operating farms of a certain size, uh, that were either primarily corn or bean production. And again, we're looking at farmers mostly from Ohio, but we drew also some, uh, some areas uh, in Indiana and, Mich and Michigan. We got a pretty good response rate, 38%, um, sent out two rounds of a mail survey um, to a total of 7,500 farmers, and with a 38% uh, response rate, um, had something you know in the, the mid 2000s in terms of total responses. Um, we collected data on a variety of things, uh, farm characteristics as well as operator characteristics. Um, and then we had a part of the survey in which we, we, we wanted to understand the intersection between, as, I have been, as I've been emphasizing, there's heterogeneity in people and there's also heterogeneity in the landscape. And so we wanted to understand kind of the intersection of those things. And so part of the survey was asking farmers pick a particular field that you operate, um, and we gave them a, a, a category in terms of how productive that field is. So, you know, in terms of, is this a highly productive field? In other words, it has great soil quality and, you know, just a great drainage, or is it not a, is it, we had low, medium, and high in terms of productivity. Um, and so, and then we said, describe that field for us. Um, and then we, and then we asked a bunch of questions about, um, you know, how are you operating that field? And then some hypothetical questions, or what are what are called um, choice experiments, to look at under certain different conditions, how might you make changes in terms of how you're, the kinds of crops you're planting on that field and how you're managing that field. So that um, has that generated a lot of the data then that we use um, for our for our modeling. So one of the examples of the models that I want to share with you uh, in terms of the the farmer decision making model is this question of phosphorus fertilizer application. If you go back to and recall from the hydrological uh, watershed modeling, one of those scenarios said, if farmers could, would, if we could get a 50% reduction in the amount of phosphorus fertilizer that's applied, then that would go a long ways towards um, achieving this 40% reduction goal. And so one question is, uh, you know, what, uh, how do we do that? Um, and what is the decision making behind applications of phosphorus? Um, and so uh, one of the questions that we looked at was uh, how much does the cost of phosphorus matter in these decisions? Uh, and so that if we can understand that, then we could do a hypothetical scenario where we say, well, what if we put a tax on phos phosphorus? How much additional reductions in phosphorus are we likely to see if, we, if for example, we double the cost of, of the fertilizer, of the phosphorus fertilizer? Um, and so we developed a statistical model in which we're estimating uh, the farmer's rate of phosphorus application, again, on a given field with a given uh, set of characteristics, um, as a function of, uh, of the, uh, the heterogeneity in, that, in those physical characteristics, um, as well as the economic characteristics. So, you know, for example, the fertilizer price that farmers are paying, uh, and then also the farmer characteristics themselves. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, <clears throat> but because we're working with a behavioral 
scientists, um, she really encouraged us to look at things like, uh, the, to really try to get at some of the underlying beliefs um, and, and, um, and values and perceptions that different farmers have. Um, and I'll, I'll highlight just uh, some, some examples of that would be things like trying to understand um, how risk averse a particular farmer is. You know, how much are they willing to take on risk um, to try to uh, achieve an increase in profits or a, or a reduction in, uh, in phosphorus. Um, another example would be how much do they, how, you know, what is kind of their ethic? Uh, do they see themselves as environmental stewards or not? And so we had some of these variables that we were able to, to, um, to include in our model. And as I'll, I'll show you in a bit, some of these variables actually um, mattered, mattered quite a lot. So um, fertilizer costs, uh, just FYI to kind of frame this, uh, they've actually come down in recent years um, in, the, in the Midwest. Um, they're sitting at um, under $100 per acre, um, but they have been as high as $160 per acre um, in, in recent years. Um, and it's about, you know, on average 20, 25% of the total production costs of, uh, of this, is, this example is for corn production but about 20 to 25 percent of the total production cost per acre. So, you know, a tax that doubles that is, is going to be meaningful in terms of the additional amount that farmers are paying. So how much, so, okay, the term elasticity came up yesterday. <laughs> so let's return to this idea of elasticity um, because that is the crucial thing that we have to understand here is given a change in the price, here we're thinking about an increase in price because we're thinking about taxing fertilizer, what is the responsiveness of farmers to that change in price? That's what an elasticity tells us. It tells us, given a percent change in price, that the, the, the farmer is going to change their demand, in this case, demand for fertilizer, by X percent. Right, that's what the elasticity tells us. So elasticities um, vary between zero and one. Right? So we could have a, a 1% change, at, well, they vary, that, that's, a, that's a false statement. They actually vary um, much more than that. But just to give you an example of a, a very elastic response would be that a 1% change in price leads to a much greater percent change in quantity, right? So that would be elastic. Elastic would be that a 1% change in price leads to a, a lower amount, a uh, lower change. So here we found relatively inelastic uh, demand for fertilizer. So here, the, the, the scenario we ran is given a 100% increase in fertilizer price, how much would farmers reduce their applications of fertilizer on corn crops and then soybean crops? And here you can see the estimated elasticities are less than 100%. Um, so unsurprisingly, the price goes up, demand for fertilizer goes down. So we expect that to be a negative price elasticity. Um, but here the mean estimate was, for example, a 100% increase in fertilizer price the application rate goes down by about 38, 39% for corn crops and uh, a little less than 50% for soybean crops. So the, uh, and then we found that there's some variability here. Uh, so interestingly, farmers that are more familiar with some of these best management practices that are commonly called the four R's, right placement, right timing, uh, right source, and the, I forget the fourth one, uh, but these are, you know, it's a, it's a way that the best ma management practices have been marketed to farmers. Um, they're, they're actually um, um, more, they've got a higher price less. So there's an additional reduction there if farmers understand the benefit of, of reducing their fertilizer application. Um, and, and then there's a substitutability here with, with soil quality. And so we find some interesting heterogeneity here in terms of these fertilizer um, price elasticities. But once we have these estimated, then we can do scenarios. So we can say, well, what if, for example, there's a 25% increase in a tax, a 50% increase in a tax. Uh, we can think about targeting. So 50% tax only on <coughs> parcels that have steep slopes. So this would be kind of a spatial targeting implementation of the policy. 100% um, tax down here. And here you can see what the um, what the uh, average reduction is um, across all farmers in the, in the survey that we estimated. And then we can use this information to plot this. So here we have kind of this trade-off curve. 
on one hand, we've got what the policy costs per acre are because um, this is the cost in terms of the tax to the farmer, so that's going to be a cost to them. Um, and then here's a versus the percent reduction that we get. So this is the cost to farmers. This is the benefit that we get um, in terms of the reduced phosphorus coming off of that field. And so we can plot each of these scenarios. So each of these dots represents a different scenario in terms of what the policy costs are going to be, uh, again, to the farmers versus the re reduction of their application rate. Um, and then, you know, some of these are clearly going to dominate others. I mean, we want to be able to implement a policy that's going to have the lowest cost per farmers in terms of that tax, but with the highest gain in terms of a reduction. So basically things that are further in this corner are going to be more preferred, right, because they have a higher net benefit than things down here. So we can draw what you might consider to be a, a trade-off frontier um, in which we identify the set of policy options that are most preferred. So for example, anything that would fall along this frontier is preferred to anything that is underneath lies in here because we can get addition for the same amount of cost, we can get additional benefits. All right, so that is one way uh, in which we can use this information about farming decision making to try to understand something about policy. Um, but, uh, and, and, and here actually the conclusion is um, that we can't achieve the desired 50% reduction in P application just based on a tax. Right? So here we get uh, the most we can, we, we, you know, with 100% tax, we can maybe get a 25% reduction. Um, so, so uh, you know, a tax alone is not going to be sufficient for achieving the goal. Um, the next example I want to share with you is, uh, is the alternative approach in which rather than taxing farmers, we're paying them. All right, so here we're going to incentivize them to adopt a best management practice. Um, we're going to look at, we're, we're looking at two. Um, the results I have today are just focusing on this one because we're still looking at cover crops. So we're looking at the adoption of subsurface placement of fertilizer uh, as a best management practice as a means, again, of reducing the amount of phosphorus that's running off um, into Lake Erie. So going back to those uh, initial swap modeling uh, exercises that showed that, um, that in addition to reducing the amount of phosphorus that gets applied, trying to incentivize some of these uh, best management practices is another way in which we can try to get to that 40% reduction goal. All right, so again, we're using data from the farmer survey to look at this. Here you can see some of the behavioral variables I mentioned uh, that we're also using in our, in our model. So efficacy is a really interesting one. Efficacy is this idea that do farmers believe that their actions actually make a difference? So if I engage in, you know, if I go through the trouble of planting a cover crop or I go through the trouble of doing this injection um, f uh, fertilizer application rather than a broadcast method, right? That's additional cost to me. It takes more time. It's much easier, you can imagine, just to simply broadcast the fertilizer as I'm driving my fertilizer uh, cart or uh, a unit across the field rather than actually injecting it. I sh the, the picture here is, is uh, of, of the ejection uh, equipment um, and so doing this takes more time, right? And so it's going to be more costly. So do I actually believe that taking the time to engage in these best management practices is going to be, is going to make a difference? Uh, that's what that efficacy variable is measuring. It's a, it's a, it's a belief um, variable. And so was that like a mean of 2.5 or something? Yes. Um, so we were looking at these on a scale of, um, I think it was 1 to 7. Okay, Likert. Likert, exactly. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then, you know, relatedly, I mentioned uh, the risk preferences and the farmer identity as being other things that are potentially, um, potentially meaningful in terms of understanding um, these, the heterogeneity of these choices. Um, we're also looking at differences across age as well as different across differences across um, income levels um, and then of course differences in the field level characteristics themselves, the size of the field, the soil quality, the slope, etc. All right, so, um, so we do this in two stages. Uh, we first we have to estimate what the costs are of engaging in the subsurface placement. And so we have a, a, a first stage regression model in which we're estimating the uh, cost of adoption for subsurface placement. 
Um, and so here we've got total cost of production um, as our left-hand side variable. And then we're decomposing that based on a variety of uh, both field and farmer characteristics. So it makes sense that the total cost would be a function of field characteristics, right? So I might not have to apply as much if I have high soil quality, for example. I might not need as much fertilizer. It also makes sense that the cost might vary, vary with farmer characteristics. Um, the more experience I have, uh, maybe I know how to do it better. And so my costs are lower, for example. And so um, those are, uh, so what we find here um, is that engaging in subsurface placement is costly. There's a positive and significant coefficient. Uh, but if I'm older, so maybe I've got more experience, I know a little bit more what I'm doing, there's a significantly negative effect there. So it reduces the cost by a little bit. Um, and if I'm farming a larger area, uh, there's a reduction in cost. You could kind of think of that as an economies of scale kind of thing that, you know, it's, it, it's, it's less costly for me since I'm just running my tractor over a larger area. So on a per, this is all uh, per acre, by the way, so it's less costly on a per acre basis. Um, the, and and a, if we, we then basically can take these coefficients and calculate an estimated cost per acre. If we do that for the mean farmer and field characteristics is about $24 per acre. The second part of this then is to look at the likelihood of farmer adoption. Um, and, oh, oh interesting. Okay. Uh, Oh, I had a different slide. I must have skipped it. That explained this a little bit more. Um, but the uh, the uh, the um, statistical model we're using here is called an ordered logent model. And so in the in the survey, what we did is we surveyed farmers to see are you engaging in this particular best management practice or not. So that's a zero one kind of thing. But what we also ask is what the likelihood. If you're not doing it now, what's the likelihood that you might do it in the future? And so we had. Uh, not likely at all, you know, uh, basically another Likert scale ranging from not likely at all to somewhat likely to I'm definitely going to do it, I just haven't done it yet. Um, and so in our, in our uh, choice probability modeling here, we're actually esti estimating an ordered categorical variable in which zero represents never, not going to do it at all, one represents uh, unlikely, but I might, Two represents, you know, somewhat likely. Three represents, I'm definitely going to do it. I just haven't done it yet. And four represents, I'm already doing it. So it's a, it's an ordering of the the choice probabilities. Um, and so what we find here in terms of uh, results is that this efficacy variable is is very significant and very positive. Um, and and so uh, so if I if I have a higher degree of efficacy, in other words, if I believe that my actions are, taking, are gonna make a difference, I'm more likely to adopt this particular best management practice, this subsurface um, injection. Uh, we also find then that, not surprisingly, that the subsurface placement costs are negative, right? So that's what we would expect, that because this is costly, it reduces the likelihood of adoption. Um, and uh, interestingly, we, we find that uh, in it, uh, while the costs vary with the field size and with age, we don't find any other uh, significant relationships there in terms of the, the field level. So we can take this and do policy scenarios. So here we've got, again, kind of a similar kind of trade-off curve than what you saw before. We have a, the payment program in terms of the dollars per acre. Um, this is in terms of uh, how much we're going to, again, pay the farmer to engage in this adoption practice and then what the percent increase is in terms of adoption rate. And so you, here we can see that, wow, if we're willing to pay farmers, let's say, $80 per acre to adopt this uh, best management practice, you know, we'll get a 90% increase in the percent of farmers that are actually doing it. Um, but you know, $80 per acre to pay farmers to do this is a hugely expensive. All right, so, um, and that doesn't even answer then fully what we're really trying to get at, which is, is this really gonna reduce the phosphorus loadings by 40%? So to do that, what we do is we take our policy simulations uh, uh, from the farmer side of things, and now we've gotta blow this up. Remember, that's all at the individual level scale. Now we gotta blow it up across the whole mommy watershed to understand, well, if we put a policy in place that, let's say, paid farmers $40 an acre to engage in this, adopt in, in this uh, subsurface, placement of phosphorus, 
what is our prediction in terms of how many are actually going to do it and how do we blow that up across the whole watershed to understand then at a cumulative level how much of a change in that land management practice is going to make a difference in terms of these loadings uh, into Lake Erie. All right, so how do we do that? We have, a ton we have over 180,000 land parcels here. 80, again, 85% of them are agricultural. We know what the, from USDA, we've, we know the, uh, what the crop rotation looks like, so we know what the cropping pattern is. Um, and then from our survey, we have surveyed, you know, about 2,700 of these, um, and we know in, in a lot of detail what those practices are. Uh, but we have to go from a survey of 2,700 parcels up to uh, the, the total population of agricultural parcels in this region if we want to generate this, this prediction. And so that's what we mean by this spatial simulation model, is translating the individual choice probabilities into this watershed scale simulations. And so uh, we do this in the following way. We, first of all, we are calculating the predicted probability at the individual field and farm level. You already saw that uh, from before. We know that that prediction is heterogeneous across space because it varies with the size of the field. And it's heterogeneous across individuals because it varies with different characteristics such as age, income and beliefs. Um, once we get that predicted probability for the individual field level, um, then we have to go from a predicted probability into an actual decision. Did, did, is, in other words, we can't just look at a predicted probability because, uh, because that doesn't tell us whether the land management actually changed or not. So we need a, simulation, a way of simulating did this land management decision actually happen or not. And so the way we do this is we draw a random number between 0 and 1. Um, and then and we generate a predicted probability f for a given set of characteristics of the farmer and the, and the field. Uh, and then if that predicted probability exceeds the randomly drawn number, then we say the, the practice is implemented. And so that's the way we're dealing with this, this, um, this uh, prediction. And it can also incorporate uncertainty because then we can do this multiple times, right? And we can actually simulate thousands of times and look at the distribution of this. All right, so, um, so, that's, so that's how we handle it. Now, the, the, the next thing, uh, the, the other thing to point out here is that we're going from individual farmers to uh, predicting a share of the land that is being uh, managed in this with subsurface placement in a county. Now, why do we think about a county? You know, because again, we don't know the population of farmers. We only know the this, this sample from our survey. So we don't know what everyone's beliefs are. We don't know what everyone's income is. We don't know what everyone's ages are. Right, so there are these key variables that we know matter in terms of generating this predicted probability of adoption, but we don't know for the whole population. At the county level, we know the distribution of income. We know the distribution of age. And, uh, and we just we punt on the belief. We just you know, use the mean value. Now, we could um, the mean value from our survey. Efficacy is a really interesting one, though. So we could do these policy scenarios or alternative scenarios where we say, well, what if there's you know, some kind of education campaign? Or what if there's something that increases the efficacy of farmers in this region? Um, and, and so we could do that. kind. We haven't, I haven't done it, so I'm not going to show it with, to you. But we could do the, those kind of what if scenarios. And that's really the, one of the powerful things about putting together a model like this is that in addition to doing policy scenarios like what I'm showing you here now, you can also do kind of these other hypothetical or what if scenarios. Um, so what if we were to increase the efficacy rate uh, or beliefs of farmers by X percent, how much of a difference would that make in terms of um, these actions? All right, so on the physical modeling side, um, let me just talk a little bit about that. The, uh, the SWAT model, the Soil and Water Assessment Tool, which is SWAT for short, uh, is a watershed uh, physical hydrology model um, that is based on these uh, hydrological response units, or HRUs. Um, and so we take the whole watershed, we divide it up into sub-basins, sub and then we divide those sub-basins up into hydrological response units based on areas that are similar in terms of land use, slope, soil type. Now we've done this um, for a high degree of spatial articulation. We have 1,482 sub-watersheds delineated, again, within this MAMI watershed. And then, with, and then we divide that further into these uh, HRUs um, for a total of almost 1,000 
spatial units. That's on the physical hydrology side. Um, and so that's a, you know, so imagine dividing this whole area up into a, a thousand spatial units. They're not obviously all uniform, but that's a high degree of spatial articulation. Um, and then we, this model is calibrated um, using a bunch of different data, uh, which, um, which I won't show you. Um, and, uh, but again, things like land use, temperature, land management, land use, et cetera. And so then we take the uh, simulations of the land management practices under these different scenarios. And we looked at three different scenarios. Um, we looked at um, the, um, uh, so we looked at uh, the different scenarios being the different cost payment programs. And so this is what the result looks like. So we've got a result here for total phosphorus as well as uh, uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus. Here we have the percent reduction in total phosphorus. Um, in term, oh sorry, here's, this is the percent reduction in total phosphorus. Um, again, this is the phosphorus that is running into the lake, right, based on different scenarios for cost share. So here, this is the different scenarios for cost share going from zero cost share all the way up through, um, you know, $80 an acre cost share, again, for subsurface placement. So what you see here then is what the total cost is, which is just going to be a, a you know, linear increase based on increasing dollar amount. Uh, and then this red line is what the percent reduction is in terms of the actual aggregate runoff of total phosphorus into the lake based on the predictions of the farmer behavior model uh, integrated with the predictions of the SWAT model. Um, and, so, and then here you see the total costs. Um, and then we've done the same thing for dissolved reactive phosphorus in terms of looking at the, uh, the total costs and the percent reduction. Here you, see, so here you see the percent reduction of DRP is actually a little bit better. Um, we can get all the way up to about 12% reduction in DRP. Um, in contrast, with total phosphorus reduction, we're only able to get up to about 6%. But then you have to come over here and look at these numbers. This is. $250 million that we would be spending for a 6% reduction in total phosphorus. And here we would have, you know, again, about a $250 million expenditure in total um, for about a 12% reduction in dissolved reactive phosphorus. So conclusions are, yes, with the subsidy program, this is specific, again, to the uh, subsurface placement, of up to $80 an acre, we can, we can uh, make an impact. Uh, we can um, essentially double the adoption rate of the subsurface placement, um, but it leads to relatively modest decreases ultimately in the amount of total phosphorus and dissolved reactive phosphorus that's running into the lake based on the, the predictions of the SWAP model. Um, and so clearly this is, n this is something that could be uh, partially effective, but is not a full solution. It's, it's uh, way too costly as a program. Um, I, there's no way the Ohio residents would support something like that. Um, and it's also not getting us totally to the goal that we are looking for, which is that 40% reduction goal. Um, so that's where we are with this analysis. Uh, the next step is to look at a combination of subsidies. So not just subsurface placement uh, subsidies and not just a tax, but a combination of those things along with, as I said before, um, a, 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 a cover crop uh, subsidy as well to see if maybe in combination we can get further down the road in terms of that 40% reduction goal. And as we saw before, there's probably some gains to be thinking about hotspot targeting um, so that rather than trying to pay everyone to do these things, we're really targeting farmers that are on those so-called hotspots uh, where soils are, are particularly um, uh, you know, the, the soil's not retaining the phosphorus as much, and so it's more likely to run off, or it's hard, and so it runs off the surface more, or it, um, uh, the, sli the, the, the slopes are steeper. So if we were to do hotspot targeting, uh, that would be one way of, of trying to um, better match the payment to the damage function. So in conclusion, my, my, uh, my, uh, pitch for this kind of modeling. Um, you know, we're, we're really not predicting in any kind of precise way. Um, you know, there is certainly a lot of error that is, is generated in this, but what we are doing 
is trying to project future outcomes under different policy scenarios or different alternative futures. And so for those of you who are familiar with, for example, the IPCC and the kinds of global uh, climate change modeling and scenarios that they're doing there, this is you know, very similar. It's just a different, um, it's, a, it's a different scale. It's at a regional scale and it's a different question. We're looking at water quality instead of uh, climate change. But it's similar in that we're integrating the human component with the ecological and environmental component to try to do these kinds of um, policy scenarios to better help us understand what these trade-offs look like. So to, to conclude, um, I like this quote from George Box, and many of you probably know that quote. <laughs> so thank you.